Do you want to make super groovy 2D characters like this? Today we're going to find out how using the free and open source Blender Grease Pencil. Hi everyone, in this video we're going to make a 2D cutout character using Blender Grease Pencil. I've done what I can to make this video accessible to those who have never rigged anything in Blender before but there's a lot to learn for those with more experience as well. If you have any trouble following along, please feel free to leave a comment down below and you're bound to get a helpful response. Opening up Blender, we can select the 2D animation preset. First, we need a design. I started off drawing three different iterations and just played around. Eventually, I chose this one. Okay. Exiting out of draw mode by pressing Control tab uh, we can create a new object. Shift A, then under Grease Pencil, press blank. Back in draw mode on the new object, we can start drawing a sketch in a neutral pose. This makes life easier when we get into rigging. Next, we start drawing the different segments of the character on their own layers making sure to keep everything in one object. You can find the layers under the Data Properties tab or the squiggly little icon. Um, to make a new layer, we can press the plus button and the minus button will remove it. A little pro tip, which should be helpful, is if you click on the little drop down menu and select Auto Lock Inactive Layers, this will stop you from being able to change anything on layers that aren't currently selected. This will stop you from drawing something on the wrong layer. For this, I just used the default pencil brush and a few simple materials. Okay, here we are. We're ready to start rigging. Before we get started, I want to go over some fundamentals. The one thing that all rigs need are bones. For this, we need to add what's called an armature object. In object mode, we press Shift A and select armature, then single bone. This will create a new object, which we can see in the outliner over here. With this new object selected, we can enter edit mode by selecting it from this drop down menu or pressing tab. This way we can add new bones without adding objects to the scene. We can select our bone here and press G, R or S to move, rotate or scale. Here's a little tip. To gain control when scaling, make sure that your cursor is at a distance from the selected bone before pressing S. We could add a new bone in a few different ways. First, we could press Shift A and a new bone appears, completely separate from anything we've done before, but still in the same object. On the other hand, we could extrude a new bone from the existing bone here. Just select the end node and press E, and there we go, a new bone. This one is connected and parented to the first. I'll go over what that means in a bit. Also, we could split the existing bone into multiple by right clicking and pressing subdivide. In the bottom left of the screen, we can see a little drop down menu. This contains the options for the last action that we just did. In this case, we subdivided the bone. We can open this up and choose how many cuts we want to make. The next fundamental principle that we need to understand when rigging is the concept of parenting. When a bone is the child of another bone, it follows all movements. There are two ways a bone can be a child of another one, either connected or disconnected. When we extrude a bone, it's connected. This means that the top of the parent will always be in the same position as the base of the child. We can select the bone and press Alt P and select Disconnect Bone. Now we can move this off to the side, but as indicated by this little dotted line, it is still a child. If we press Alt P again, but this time select Clear Parent, the dotted line disappears, and with it goes any connection between the two bones. Equally, we can select one bone, and holding shift, select the other. 
Now we can press Ctrl P. This will parent the first bone to the second and we can choose between connected or keep offset. Okay, we've covered object mode and edit mode. Let's touch on pose mode. This is where we will eventually do our animation, but we also use it along the way when testing our rig. Here we can use the same G, R and S to transform our bones. And if you press Alt G, Alt R and Alt S, this will reset the original location, rotation and scale to match with edit mode. This is all a bit abstract, so let's apply these fundamentals to our character. So to get started, we add an armature object, shift A, armature and single bone. Now that we have the armature in the scene, we're going to change some settings just to make it uh, easier to work with. Firstly, in the Object Properties tab under Viewport Display, we change the Display As property to Wire. This will allow us to see through the bones, which can get rather bulky as we work. Secondly, under the Armature Properties tab under Viewport Display, we check the In Front box. The combination of these two settings means that we are always able to see the bones while also making sure that they're not covering anything important. Okay, tabbing into edit mode, I use increment snapping by holding down control to rotate the bone down to one side. This will be the root bone of our character. This will allow us to move the entire character at once when animating, so I like to add this first. It's important to name all of the bones correctly and we'll start here by pressing F2 and renaming it to Root. Correct naming will be unbelievably helpful throughout this process, from animation to adding constraints. You don't need to follow the same conventions that I do, just make sure you have your own system to follow. For example, I use a bunch of prefixes to label the functionality of each bone, also, I often append .l or .r at the end of a name if a bone has a left and right version. Once the root is in place, I move forward by adding the deformation rig. Essentially, this is a group of bones that will directly move the grease pencil object. This is by far the most intuitive and easy to understand step. Personally, I like to start from the center of gravity and move outwards. So duplicating the root bone and moving it into place, we right click and select subdivide. We now have the first two bones of the deformation rig. Just as always, we rename these. I tend to give deformation bones the prefix DEF. This just labels it clearly. Now let's get the arm set up. We can duplicate this torso bone and move and rotate it so that it's in line with the arm. We can parent it to the upper torso bone and rename it def-arm.r. Finally, we extrude some new bones for the rest of the arm and rename them. I then move on adding bones for the neck, head, other arm, legs, and anything else we need to move when animating, like the elements of the face. One thing I do to make rigging easier is pressing Alt-Z when in solid view mode. Uh, this makes everything a little transparent. I find that this can be helpful when placing bones in the middle of a joint, like the elbow. When adding the arm bones, one thing I tested was selecting both forearms and rotating them along their Z axis. In pose mode, select both bones and press R for rotate, then Z for the Z axis. I was just making sure that they would move in the same direction. Because Blender is a 3D tool, sometimes bones can get rotated around their poles or its roll. That just makes animating bones, which should act similarly, a bit more confusing than it needs to be. Testing this can be a lot easier if, under the Armature Properties tab under Viewport Display, we check the Axis box. 
This just shows the local X, Y, and Z direction of each bone. You can see here the bones were pointing so that you would rotate them around their X axis, which is fine, but the rest of the bones would rotate around their Z axis. So I selected each bone, then under the N panel, under the item tab, under transform, I changed the roll value. When I did this, I made sure to hold down the Alt key to make sure that the transformation applied to all the selected bones and not just the active one. Once the face bones are added and everything is named well, we're done with the deformation side of the rig. The next step is to attach the grease pencil object so that the rig controls it. First, we want to select the root bone, then under the bone properties, uncheck the deform box. This just tells Blender not to use this bone to deform the grease pencil object. Then we enter into object mode, select the grease pencil object, shift select the armature, then we just press Ctrl P and select parent armature deform with empty groups. What this does is automatically adds an armature modifier to the grease pencil object with the armature as a target. And it also adds vertex groups, one for every bone in the armature named accordingly. Now all we need to do is go through each vertex group and assign the vertices or points that we want to be affected. We can do this in two ways. Either enter edit mode, then select the vertex group, then select the vertices and press the assign button under the vertex groups panel. Or go into weight paint mode, select the vertex group and just start painting. For this style of animation, I tend to use the edit mode method mostly, with a little bit of weight painting when I want a smoother transition between two bones. Let's go through this with the arm. First we select the upper arm vertex group, then the points that make up the arm, then press assign. Then we move on to the forearm, select the group, select the points and press assign and we repeat it with the hand. Okay, with that done, we just move on to the rest of the character. Once we've tested our vertex weights by posing our armature in pose mode and corrected any errors, we're ready to move on to our first bones that don't directly affect the grease pencil object. Essentially, there are a few layers of the rig that we need to create. The most fundamental and most intuitive is the deformation layer. These are the bones that will directly affect the grease pencil objects. These could be compared to the underlying armature of a marionette puppet, connecting all the limbs. This gives our character structure, but would be complicated to animate manually. So we make another set of bones, the mechanism bones. And this is where rigging a character can begin to feel a bit like programming. These build on the structure of the deformation bones, making them easier to control. These are like the strings on our puppet. Finally, we have the control bones. These are the ones that the user interacts with or animates, like the crossbars of the puppet. To recap, the control bones affect the mechanism bones, these then affect the deformation bones, which finally move our grease pencil character. Lots of flexibility with simple controls. In this instance, I decided that I wanted a bone that would control the entire face at once, between the head bone and the various face bones. To do this, I duplicated the nose bone, shift D, called it MCH-face, then we parent all the face bones to this new one by selecting them, shift selecting the face bone, parenting them with control P and choosing keep offset. 
the MCH prefix on this new bone labels it as a mechanism bone, as opposed to a deformation bone. Okay, moving on, we're going to go through each part of the rig and get it working as we want. Let's start with the torso. Before we get into how I went about this, I'm just going to show you how I wanted the finished result to look like. Right now, the bone chain starts from the bottom of the hips and moves up towards the shoulders. However, when animating, I prefer for everything to pivot closer to the center of gravity. Secondly, while I still want to rotate the upper torso like this, I also want to add some squash and stretch on top of that. So how are we going to go from here to there? We start by duplicating the current torso bones and moving them to a new layer. The armature has 32 different layers that can be found in the armature properties, and we can move the bones between these layers by selecting them, pressing M, and then selecting the layer we want. There are some add-ons that provide a more intuitive solution, and I would recommend checking those out, but for the sake of this tutorial, I only want to use tools available in Blender by default. Okay, with our duplicated torso bones on another layer, we can now extrude a new bone at the character's center of gravity. Just select the joint and press E for extrude. I like to call this bone CTRL-COG. The COG stands for center of gravity. And the prefix just labels it as a bone that the animator will control directly. Also, I want to rename the other torso bones with the prefix CTRL and get rid of the .001 suffix that's automatically added to the end of duplicated bones. Okay, let's get started on that functionality. Firstly, let's get the parenting in order. We select the cog bone and unparent it, as this should be the highest in the hierarchy. We press Alt-P and select unparent bone. Then we select the upper torso bone and shift select the cog bone and press Control p to parent it. Before parenting the lower torso bone, we need to flip it around so that it pivots from the middle. With the bone selected, we can press Alt-F to flip the bone. Then we can parent it to either the cog bone or the upper torso bone, depending on how you would prefer it to work. Try both and test it out in pose mode. Okay. This upper torso bone can rotate, just as we want it to, but if we want to add some stretch and squash, we're going to have to duplicate it and scale it down just to differentiate it from the first bone. We do this by pressing the full stop or period key and select individual origins from the pie menu. This will make the bone scale from its base. Then we just press S for scale and drag the mouse until we're happy. We then name this bone as CTRL Torso ROT for rotation, and rename the other bone to MCH-Torso. This is because we will use the smaller bone to rotate the torso, but the other bone will help with the stretch functionality, but will not be the control for that. Next, we can extrude a new bone from the top of the torso bone and unparent it. Then we can add a stretch to bone constraint to the torso bone. We can do this in one of two ways. Either through the bone constraint tab, select the correct bone, add the constraint and fill out the properties. Or the other option is to select the control bone that we want it to stretch to, shift select the bone we want to apply the constraint to, Press Control Shift C and select the Stretch 2 constraint from the pop up menu. This will automatically create the constraint with all the properties filled out. Now we can see the stretch control can move the bone around just as we want. In order to have both the default rotation functionality as well as the stretching, all we need to do is parent the stretch control to the rotation control, 
You may want to hide the torso bone that stretches to the control in edit mode when doing this. Press H to hide the selected bones. And there we go, just like we had planned. Isn't that cool? Okay. Now we want to make the deformation bones follow these control and mechanism bones. Let's start with the lower torso because it's the most tricky as the deformation bone is facing the other way from the control bone. The way I went about doing this was first adding a copy location constraint, then selecting the armature and the control bone as the target. This shifted the bone up to the center of gravity which is not where we want it. So I slid the head or tail slider to one. This means that the base of the deformation bone will always be at the end of the control bone. Then we need to set the rotation by adding a stretch to constraint after the copy location. We set the target as the armature and then the same control torso bone. And boom, it works just like we want. For the top half of the torso, we can simply add a copy transform constraint to the deformation bone, targeting the torso mechanism bone. This just copies the transformations from the mechanism bone and applies it to the deformation bone. We just select the deformation bone, add a copy transform constraint, set the target to the armature, and the mechanism torso bone. Now it seems to work, except one thing. I don't want the head to scale with the torso like that. So how do we fix this? If we unparent the neck bone from the torso bone, then it doesn't scale, just like we want. But now it doesn't follow the location either, which we do want. So let's extrude a new bone at the base of the neck called MCH neck attachment. And just like the neck, we'll unparent it. This will act as a buffer between the torso and the neck. Now we just parent the neck bone to the buffer. Next, we add a copy location constraint to the neck attachment bone by selecting the torso, shift selecting the attachment, and pressing Control shift c and selecting Copy Location. We then add a Copy Rotation constraint in the same way, and this happens. Which is not what we want. We're going to need to change some of the properties in those constraints. On the Copy Location constraint, we just slide the Head Tail slider up to 1. And now, it's not moving the bone to the bottom of the torso bone, but the top. Right now, the copy rotation constraint points them in the same direction in world space. That's why the head is sticking out to the side. If we change the constraint to use local space, then it goes back to how we want it. And seemingly, it's working now. One thing that I'm going to do before we finish is add a copy scale constraint to the attachment bone. But instead of targeting the torso bone like the others, we target the rotation control. This way, if we scale the entire character for whatever reason, then the head will follow with that. Next, we're going to get the head going. First step, just like before, we duplicate the deformation bone and move it to the second layer. After renaming this to control head and parenting it to the neck control bone, it's working fine. There is one thing that I would like to change. At the moment when we rotate the neck or the body, the head rotates too. And that's not bad, sometimes that's exactly what we want. But other times, I want the character to lean forward and the head stays upright without needing to counter animate it like this. If I unparent the head bone and add a copy location constraint targeting the neck with the head tail property set to one, then it works the other way. But as I said, I want to be able to switch between these two methods. So what we're going to do is extrude a bone 
at the base of the head called MCH head follow dash one. Then duplicate this, change the name from follow dash one to follow dash two and scale it down with the pivot point set to individual origins. Then we parent the little one to the neck bone and we unparent the big one. Finally, with the head bone parented to the bigger bone, we just add a copy location, scale, and rotation constraints to the bigger bone, all targeting the small bone. We seem to have come full circle. The head is following the rotation just like before. Except now, on the larger following bone, if we change the influence slider on the copy rotation constraint, we effectively switch between the two methods. Later on, we'll attach the value of the slider to a more animator accessible control, but for now, I'm happy. The arms of this character are going to be a little more complicated. Similarly to the head, I want to be able to switch between two kinds of rigs, depending on the context of the animation. In this case, sometimes I want to be able to rotate each segment of the limb individually, working from the shoulder out. This is known as FK or forward kinematics. Other times I want to be able to move a control at the wrist and the rotation of the arm segments update automatically like this. This is known as IK or inverse kinematics. The way that I like to do this is to duplicate the deformation bones and move them along like this before moving them to a new layer. This chain of bones will be the FK rig and we'll rename them to reflect that. We can do that by selecting all of them, pressing F3 and search for batch rename. Using find and replace, we find DEF and replace with CTRL or control. Then making sure we change it from objects to bones, we can press OK and the change will be made. Now we can do this again and this time search for .001 and replace with nothing. At this point, I change to the layout workspace. I find that it's easier to see the bones and I really should have done this earlier. Just like the head rotation thing, I want the same on the FK arms. So just like the head, we extrude two bones. We add copy location and rotation constraints on the larger bone, targeting the smaller bone. Then a copy scale bone targeting the torso rotation control. Then the arm is parented to the bigger bone and the little bone is parented to the torso bone. After moving the bones back into place, I like to scale the control bones down just to more easily differentiate them from the deformation bones while they're all still visible. Okay, now I will add some copy transform constraints to the deformation bones targeting the FK controls. To do this, we just select the control bone, shift select the deformation bone, press control shift C and select copy transforms. Then I duplicated and moved the deformation bones again and renamed them. These ones will be for the inverse kinematics or IK. Because we duplicated the deformation bones after adding the FK constraints to them, these new bones also have them. So we'll have to go ahead and delete those. Go into the constraints panel in pose mode and with the bone selected, hover over the constraint and press X. Okay, for the IK, I like to add a shoulder control. This isn't strictly necessary, but I find that it's a cleaner way to work. Then we add a wrist control. So next we select the forearm bone and in the bone constraints tab, we add an inverse kinematics constraint. Then in the target field, we select the armature then the wrist control for the bone. Finally, we set the chain length to two so that it doesn't go up all the way to the base of the torso. Now we can see that it works as we want. 
One thing that I like to do is have the rotation of the hand dependent on the rotation of the IK control. So what we can do is in edit mode, select the hand and parent it to the wrist control. Now it seems to work like we want, unless the control moves too far away and we cut off our character's hand. Oops. So to fix this, we just add a copy location constraint on the hand, targeting the forearm. This will snap its location to the elbow. So in the constraint, we slide the head tail slider to one. And now it's not locked to the elbow, but the wrist. Finally, we need to apply a second set of copy transform constraints to the deformation bones this time targeting the IK rig. Now that that's done, we just have to do it all again for the other arm. We duplicate everything twice, shift them along, renaming them along the way. We add that following mechanism, big bone, little bone, the arm is a child of the big bone, the big bone is attached through constraints to the little bone, and the little bone is a child of the torso bone. We add the shoulder IK bone parented to the torso bone, along with that wrist parented to the root bone. We then add the IK constraint and attach the hand. Parent it to the wrist control and constrain its location to the end of the forearm bone. Finally, we constrain each of the deformation bones to their FK counterparts and then repeat it for the IK. And to finish it all off, we simply move the FK bones and IK bones back in line with the drawing, pressing M to move them to a new layer, just to keep everything separated. Now we have the ability to control the arms using IK or FK, and to switch between the two. Next, we're going to do the same thing on the legs. This is very similar, but there are some key differences. The first difference is how we set up the FK system. Based on how I wanted to use this character, I decided I didn't need the same following functionality as I did for the arms and head. So essentially, we can just move on without touching it. In contrast, the IK system is a lot more complicated than it was for the arms. After adding the hip control at the top of the chain, we add another bone at the ankle, like the one at the wrist of the arms. But this one is just a mechanism bone rather than a control. The animator will never touch this one. Instead, this will be a target of the IK constraint but a child of the actual control bone. Moving on, the foot bone has a slight offset from the end of the shin bone. This makes life a little challenging regarding how constraints work. For example, we can't add a copy location constraint without it snapping to the end of the bone. We can fix this by adding a buffer bone. I called this MCH foot base IK dot R. So now this new bone can be a child of the shin bone and the foot bone a child of the new bone. Now if we add a copy rotation constraint to the new bone targeting the IK bone, this will function exactly the same as the arm rig. The foot rotates with the IK bone but stays attached to the leg. All of this may sound a bit confusing, but just think of it as a way to separate the different parts of the rig, making it more modular and easier to work with. This concept is very powerful. It's the same concept that we used with the big bone, little bone setup to help with the FK arms and the head. The next thing I want to add is a really cool foot rolling mechanism as shown here. To do this, we're going to need two bones. One that pivots from the ball of the foot and the other that pivots from the heel. The heel roll bone will be a child of the toe roll bone. Finally, the IK bone is a child of the heel roll bone. 
Now, no matter which bone is rotated, the entire foot goes with it. Also, we'll quickly add a control bone for the entire foot IK. Next, we're going to make sure that the toe doesn't rotate when the foot rolls forward. To do this, we just add a copy rotation constraint to the toe bone. This will target the toe roll bone. Then we set it to use local space instead of global space. Finally, we set it to only affect the Z axis and also invert the Z axis. The effect of this is that when the foot rolls forward, the toe rotates in the opposite direction, cancelling the motion so it remains horizontal. This two bone system isn't the most intuitive way of controlling this, so we'll extrude a new bone from the heel. This will control both bones at once. Okay, to do this, we add a copy rotation constraint to the heel roll bone, targeting the new control bone. We set it to use local space. At the moment, the rotation works the wrong way. We could fix this by inverting the rotation on the constraint, but I chose to do this by entering edit mode and selecting the control bone and then adding 180 degrees to the roll property. Now back in pose mode, when we rotate the bone, it works as expected. Unless we rotate it forwards, we don't want that. So on the heel roll bone, we're going to add another constraint, a limit rotation constraint. Using this, we limit the Z axis with zero as the minimum and we'll put the max to 90 degrees for now. With this, when we rotate the control bone, the foot doesn't roll back more than 90 degrees and doesn't roll forwards at all. Also, I chose to add a limit rotation constraint to the actual control bone. We then repeat the same process for the toe roll bone, adding 180 degrees to the roll property because it rotates the wrong way by default. Make sure that this control bone is parented to the IK foot control. If it's parented to the wrong bone, then this happens. Okay, we'll move them onto their own layers and move them back in line with the drawing. Finally, we just add copy transform constraints to the deformation bones to each of the FK bones and then the IK bones, just like we did for the arms. Select the control bone, shift select the deformation bone, press control shift C and select copy transforms. That was a lot of work. So it's lucky that instead of repeating this entire process again for the other leg, we can just duplicate all the bones and shift them over. This will mess up their names, so we use the batch rename tool to find .r.001 and replace it with .l. There is one issue with this, in that the deformation bones don't line up exactly with the control bones, and they really need to. So to fix this, I snap the various mechanism bones and control bones to the deformation bones. By selecting the various joints making up the deformation bones, pressing Shift S and selecting Cursor to Selected. This snaps the 3D cursor to the selected joints. Then we just select the bone that we want to snap to it. Next we press Shift S and select Selection to Cursor. This snaps the bone to the cursor position. If we repeat this at every joint, then the bones line up again and everything works once more. Now we can duplicate all the face deformation bones, move them onto their own layer and rename them as control bones. Then we just add copy transform constraints to the deformation bones. Next, we just need to test our rig, mainly that we can scale, move and rotate the entire character using the root control. This means parenting any IK controls to the root. Also, making sure that everything scales correctly is quite difficult. Here, for example, 
everything below the waist stays at the same scale even when we scale the root. This is because the lower torso deformation bone copies the location of the control bone and then stretches to that. This covers location and rotation, but not scale. So we just add a copy scale constraint to it, targeting the control bone. Finally, cleaning up our rig will move all of our control bones onto their own layers. Blender's layer system has two segments by default, and I tend to keep all the bones that the animator doesn't need to worry about over on the left, and all the control bones on the right. Okay, the actual rig is pretty much done, but there are some quality of life changes I'd like to make, starting with custom bone shapes. Essentially, this works by modeling a mesh and telling a bone that it should look like that mesh. To do this, we create a new container called WGT or widget. This will contain the meshes that will dictate the shapes of the bones. First, we create a plane mesh, then tabbing into edit mode, we rotate it along its x-axis by 90 degrees so that we can see it properly. Then, back in object mode, we rename this mesh to WGT-Root. This will be the bone shape for the root control. In edit mode, we make the plane surround the character, then press X and select only faces. This will delete the face, but leave the edges around the character. Okay, moving this off to the side in object mode, we select the armature object and in pose mode, select the root bone, then under the bones property tab, under viewport display, under custom shape, we select the shape. Now the root bone looks like the mesh, but it points in the wrong direction. To fix this, we select the mesh, rotate it by 90 degrees on the Z axis then apply that rotation by pressing Ctrl A and selecting Rotation. This takes the transformation on the object and applies it directly to the vertices that make up that object. Otherwise, the transformation wouldn't apply to the bone. Finally, it's a little small, so in edit mode, we can scale the mesh up so that the bone looks as we want it. It's a finicky process, but it makes animating a lot easier. So for every control bone, we go through and add a new mesh and apply it to the bone. One thing I want to mention is sometimes we can use a multi-purpose custom mesh and tweak it using these transformation properties under the custom shape for each bone. I did this with the forward kinematic lens, and I also used a generic circle shape which was used from everything from IK controls to the face. The sizes were usually way off, so I simply corrected them using these properties. A neat trick when doing this is if you want to change the transformations of multiple shapes, you can select several bones and while holding Alt, change the values. This will then apply to all the selected bones. Okay. Technically, everything we need is there. However, we really should make it easier to switch between IK and FK. At the moment, we would need to show the deformation bone layer, select each bone one by one, and slide the influence of the copy transform constraint. Animating this would be complicated. This is where drivers come in. Drivers are essentially a tool that allows us to control any value in Blender with another value. In this case, we can create a custom value that controls the influence of all of the constraints at once. And now we just have to animate one value in the same place as the rest of our control bones. We can also use this idea to polish up some of the other functionality that we've already set up, like whether or not the arms and head 
follow the rotation of the torso, like this. To achieve this, we can add a new bone at the end of a limb. Then, in pose mode, under the bone properties, we add a custom property. We'll call this FK to IK switch. Also, check is library overridable. This just helps if you want to import your character into another Blender file. I also set it to use an integer rather than a float. It's up to you though. Now in the end panel, we can right click on this new property and select copy as new driver. Now we can go to the deformation layer like we would if we were animating the transition manually. Then we select one bone at a time and hovering over the influence of the constraint, we right click and paste driver. Repeat this for the other bones in the limb. And now we can control the transition between IK and FK with just one value on a property bone. We can then repeat this with new property bones for each limb and new custom properties. We can do the same thing to control whether or not the FK arms follow the rotation of the torso. We just add a new property called arm follow. Copy as new driver and paste it onto the copy rotation constraint of these bones. I also add a bone above the head for general controls like controlling whether the head follows or not. Okay, replacing the shape with this cog, we could call it quits here, but I'm just gonna add one more feature. I'm going to add different poses for the hands and control it with the property bones. Getting back into object mode, we can select the grease pencil object and hide the influence of the armature modifier. Then in draw mode with the timeline open and the hand layer selected, we draw a new pose on the second frame. You can add as many poses as you want, each on their own frame. But for this example, I'll just do these two. With that done, we add a time offset modifier to the object, set to fixed frame mode. Then we set the influence to only affect the hand layer. Now, back on the armature, on the arm property bone, we add a new custom property using an integer, and we copy this as a new driver. Then back on the grease pencil object again, we paste this driver on the frame value. Done. We can do this on the other hand, on the mouth of the character if we want him to talk, on anything. One important thing is that any new drawings won't be attached to the rig through the vertex groups. So make sure you assign the new frames to the correct vertex groups. With the rig finished, we need to consider a few things around how we're going to animate this character. By default, bones rotate using Quartonian rotation. Essentially, this helps to avoid something called gimbal lock when rotating in 3D space. Unfortunately, this adds a W component to the rotation, and since we're working in 2D, this does nothing except add unnecessary keyframes to our animation. To fix this, we activate all the layers of our rig, select all the bones, and under the end panel, we can alt-click on the drop-down menu under the rotation property and select XYZ Euler. Awesome! Now, in preparation of animating this character, we're going to add what's called a keying set. Here, we essentially insert a keyframe for every bone, for every property that we want to be animated. We make a new action called keying set and start adding keyframes. If you want to add keyframes to the location, for example, you can hover over the location property and press I. This will add a keyframe to the X, Y, and Z. If you want to add a keyframe to just one axis, then you can right click and press insert single keyframe. 
This process is a bit tedious, but we just make our way through and add all the keyframes we want to animate. Make sure you insert a keyframe for each custom property. In order to make this keying set useful, open up the keying dropdown on the timeline window and under active keying set, search for available. Now turn on auto keying and under the dropdown, check only active keying set. Now we can use auto keying without worrying about our timeline getting cluttered with useless keyframes. Groovy, now we just animate it. Here's my test walk cycle. Thank you all for watching. This was a really long video, so if you're still here and you've followed along, thank you, it really means a lot. Hopefully I'll see you around.